Welcome to the Chai Academy and welcome to the Chai Center. This is Rabbi Sachs coming to you live from the headquarters of the Chai Center, my office. <laughs> so Purim is coming up, the Jewish holiday of Purim, um, a very special holiday, a very festive holiday, um, a holiday where where um, kids get to dress up and people get to act silly and we celebrate and we, we eat a big meal and some people some people um, you know inebri get inebriated etc etc and um, basically there was a decree against the Jewish people and it was mitigated by by a hero and a heroine and of course God so yesterday's class remember this class you'll understand even if you didn't hear yesterday's class Yesterday's class, we asked, we posed the question, why is it called the story of Esther? Why is it called Megillus Esther, the book of Esther? Why is it called Fast of Esther? I mean, there were other players in this uh, in this story. There were there were heroes, there were heroines, there were villains, there were there were fools, there were jesters, and you know why well, Esther? Why do we pick on Esther? So one of the things we said yesterday is that. Esther was pushed the sages. She wrote it. She wrote the Megillah together with the other hero Mordechai, and she pushed, coerced the sages. And um, and and the sages, you know, they, they didn't want to do it. The sages did not want to um, have anything to do with it. They said that it's 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 going to breed anti-Semitism, as we discussed yesterday. And she said, "Don't be foolish, right? The story is known." You know, you are. It's such a unique response, by the way. It's gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna breed anti-Semitism. And she pushed, and she pushed, and she pushed, and and she reprimanded them that you know, you, you, for you to say it will breed anti-Semitism, and therefore hide behind rocks and walls, and and uh, you know, and it's just you gotta have goyim yakev. You gotta be proud. This is a story that happened to the Jewish people. This is a story that had a good ending. Um, you have to be proud, not not kind of hide it. And um, you know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of a, um, they tell this story about Rabbi Tversky, Abraham Tversky. He's probably an author of 40, 40 books. So he was on a plane. And Rabbi Tversky is, was, is a Has of the Hasidic persuasion, is a Hasid, and he was wearing his big, um, big hat, you know his Hamburg, whatever it's called, and then his long white beard, and then uh, uh, you know his his kaftan, his black kaftan that he's wearing, sitting on on a plane. And a woman turns to him, so who's sitting next to him, and turns to him in Yiddish, and she says, you know that you dressing the way you do is the cause of anti-Semitism. You just it, it's it's so embarrassing. With your hat and with your long beard and your, you know, your, your long coat, you know, you're the reason for anti-Semitism. So Rabbi Tversky is American-born, Pittsburgh. He turns to her, and and in um, in proper language, because he was a, a doctor, he was a psychiatrist. He, he ran the Gateway uh, Rehab place for many years. Um, he turns to her in perfect English. He goes, uh, "Excuse me, ma'am, I, I I I don't understand." what you're saying um i i'm not sure what language you're speaking so she said yiddish because well yiddish i don't speak yiddish i speak a little german i speak a little dutch but you see i am I, i'm i'm not who you think i am i'm 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 amish to which she responded in english it's amazing you know i really have total respect for the amish people complete respect he says that that you know you're a minority people, right? And you 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 isolate yourselves, and you keep your dress and you keep your traditions, and uh, it's just amazing. To which he then responded to her in Yiddish, right? Basically to the effect of, if I was Amish, you're fine. With the with keeping the traditions and keeping the clothing and having the beard and etc. But because I'm not Amish, I'm Jewish. You have a problem with that. Maybe the problem is not me. Maybe the problem is you and how right he is. And that's what Esther was saying. That's what Esther was telling 
the Sanhedrin, the great, you know, 71 um, Supreme Court, that, that you got to stop this. Don't worry about anti-Semitism. And she said two incredible words. And she said, I want to write this Megillah should be played, should be canonized, as we discussed yesterday, and should be read for generations. Write me down for generations. And it wasn't ego. It wasn't ego. And, and um, Esther, as you can tell from the whole story of the Megillah, had no ego. In fact, the reverse is probably true. You know, she was an orphan and uh, trauma after trauma after trauma. Um, and, but, but she said, there are lessons to be learned here. The lessons, and, and he says, and, and the lessons, the lessons to be learned, he says, first of all, that think what one person could do. Esther saved the day, pretty much single-handedly. Look what one person can do. A person should never say, I cannot. Who am I? I'm just one person. You step up to the plate and say, I'll do the best I can. That was one lesson. I think, I think um, the other lesson is you have to recognize divine providence in one's life. And that was Esther's goal. That, you know, she became queen. The whole story of the Megillah, as I said yesterday, was 11, 12 years. She became queen. It wasn't until five years later, after she became queen, this story of Purim took place and they wanted to annihilate the Jewish people, etc. Five years. But she recognized that, that she was on a journey and it wasn't, it wasn't only her journey, it was God's journey. And Mar when Mordechai told her this, it resonated with her. Mordechai said, who knows? She said, please go to the king. She goes, I can't, he didn't call me. Please go to the king. And she goes, if he doesn't summon me, I can't go. Otherwise it's death penalty. He said, stop it, stop it with your excuses. Right, this is the reason why you're queen. And, and ding, 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 ding. She said yes, and she went to the king. So, so um, recognize the journey. That's another reason why it was important for her to, to, to have it in the, in the books. We also discussed yesterday is that while everybody celebrated and Purim and everybody, them, you know, Mordechai's life went on and the Jewish people's life went on and Haman got hung and the, and the, 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 um, the, the fool, the inebriated Persian king Amalek, uh, Ahasuerus, um, he, he, he remained the king, etc. Esther's the most tragic figure because Esther remained married to the king. Her life she was still stuck. She was a Jewess. You know, she was, she, she, she went to a nice Jewish school in Persia, right? She went to a nice Jewish school. She was probably the valedictorian. And, um, and all of a sudden she was grabbed off the street, a young girl, unmarried, and um, uh, an orphan living in her uncle's house. Her uncle adopted her, Mordechai. And she was grabbed off the street, and all of a sudden she became queen, and, she, and she's sleeping with this, with this, with this non-Jewish drunk king. Who, 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 um, you know, who, who, who has his way with ma as many women as he can because he's the king. And, and um, it's really, really tragic. It's really tragic. And that's how she lived out her life. And that's what she said. Kasher vaditi vaditi. She said, I'll go to the king, as you said. And if, I'm, if I perish, I perish. The truth is she did perish. She may not have perished physically right then and there, but her whole spiritual... And, and, and you know, and there's an interesting commentary when she said, Kasher vaditi vaditi, I perish, I perish. You see, up until now, for five years, remember, King Ahasuerus grabbed her off the street. Every virgin was, was obligated to come to the king so the king can test the merchandise before he buys it. And, and she wasn't a willing partner. And even when he said, you're the one I've chosen, she still wasn't a willing partner. She never initiated anything. And uh, the Talmud says clearly she was very, she was very cold in, in, in her lovemaking. She was very passive. And here she was asked to go to the king and she said, there's only one way I'm going to survive this. And if that's I initiate. So now her initiating causes her soul 
she taints her soul while she's being you know raped and it's not uh, it's against her will right it's one thing but here she initiated it because she needed to this needed to save the Jewish people and she can no longer be called an onus someone who was coerced because she initiated it. she did it as literally as a sacrifice she sacrificed her spiritual self in order to save the Jewish people. Another concept is we find something interesting because, first of all, I, I think if we reflect, by the way, uh, Queen Esther, can you imagine a, a girl, a young Jewish girl was taken off the street in 1939 and was brought, up, brought to, to Hitler's, um, you know, the Berghof in, 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 um, in Bavaria. Um, and and um, and and it became Hitler's mistress, and and she knew that she could help m mitigate the Holocaust, minimize the Holocaust um, by 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 kowtowing to him and sleeping with him, etc. You know, would she do it? Would the person do it? Esther did. Esther did. You know, Esther had a few. I think Esther had a few choices when she was taken off the street, literally taken off the street by soldiers. Every virgin was taken off the street. Esther could have one of two things, one of three things. She could have killed herself, just literally killed herself. I'm not, I'm not being raped day in, day out by who knows what. I get into that palace where it's a free-for-all and, and they lack morals and values and I'm gonna be somebody's a sex slave. She killed herself. That's one approach she could have taken. Esther, the other approach she could have taken is that she just basically withdraws into herself and becomes a complete doormat and and uh, she she basically becomes a, a case of where she 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 becomes a dual personality one she shows to the outside and the other one is really dead inside a third approach was that she can just you know what accept it accept her fate try and live life as best as she could give up okay my former life it's done it's over there's no chance there's no hope I'm, I'm just gonna become you know I'm gonna become a Persian and I'm gonna give up on my Jewishness those are I think the three normal approaches that she could have taken and I believe this is one of the reasons why it was called the story of Esther is because she took a very unusual fourth approach. Remember, she could have killed herself. Right? I'm not, you know, I'm not, I'm not doing this. I'm not, my rest of my life in captivity, I'm not doing this. Right? She could have just completely, just, just basically put her head in the sand and just gone through the motions, but really be dead inside, albeit dead psychologically, dead emotionally, dead spiritually, right? Dead mentally albeit alive physically, just the, you know, the, the lowest level of self, right? Or she could have just once again adopted. It. Okay, I'm a Persian now. Let me adopt the Persian culture. Let me, um, you know, let me enjoy the Persian food, the Persian dance, the Persian this, the Persian that, and to heck with my past life. What she did was she fit into the role nicely. She became queen but she remained a Jew at the same time. She didn't kill herself. She didn't die inside. She didn't fully adopt the Persian culture. It was, she almost like became a hybrid. She adopted the Persian culture, but to a point. As, as, um, and, and she, as, as the Talmud says, that while she was with, with the king Ahasuerus, she kept the Shabbat. She lit those Shabbat candles. She kept kosher. Right? Nobody necessarily knew what went how, but she didn't eat some of the delicacies that were placed before her. And she kept kosher. She only ate the salmon. Right? And, and she was the queen. And, and, and she, she, that's an amazing response. That took incredible, incredible um, 
just, just absolutely incredible strength. Amazing. Amazing. She was, yes, she was, she came from good stock. Right? She, Mordechai was her uncle. And her parents, who died when she was young, right, were, were noble, good people. So she had good, she had good quality. She had good genes. She had good blood, as they say, blue blood. But, um, but nonetheless, she knew. She knew she was a Jew. She didn't tell anybody else. She couldn't. But she, she, she kept her identity within herself and with her uncle. And she connected that way. Just, just a, a remarkable, remarkable human being. Um, and, and so that's another reason why the, she's, she's, she's um, lauded is because, as the story of Esther, because nobody else gave up what she gave up. Mordechai, yes, he cried, he put on a sackcloth. Yes, he, he, he gathered incredible, he gra gathered people, the Jewish 22,000 children, and they prayed. Um, he made everybody fast. And um, and he, you know, and he was the leader. He rent his garments. I mean, he 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 worked hard at salvation. But the bottom line is, his life wasn't altered. He was on the outside, not the inside. He was living with his people. He was living in his community. He could go to Shoprite and pick up sushi. Esther couldn't. Esther was holed up, pigeonholed in the castle where she had to entertain dignitaries from 127 provinces, Mordechai had it much easier. Mordechai may have had a heart, it was a threat of annihilation of men, women, and children, of course. And Esther didn't face that because she was the queen. But, but, but Esther was, was a loner, stuck without her people, without her Torah, without her uncle, without family, without friends, without just, it's lonely on the top. It's lonely, really lonely on the top. It's lonely on the top in, in, in a community. You know, can you imagine a country? I mean, they say the, a president leads a lonely life, ultimately. Nobody understands a president like a president. Um, so it's a lonely life. It's a coveted life, and, you know, you're, and there's pomp and circumstance, and you're given a lot of honor, and it strokes your ego, etc. But all said and done, it's a lonely existence, and Esther had a lonely existence. And Esther truly, truly, she stayed in a place where, where she didn't belong. She didn't belong. And... Um, and you know, I when I, I think I think of the the rabbis in Ukraine. I think about the rabbis in the Ukraine. You know, the the it was amazing comment, amazing amazing comment. The the um, so when the war started, when 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 Putin, um, the devil, the narcissist, when he invaded Ukraine. So he wasn't going to bomb civilians. Nobody believed he would attack civilians. It was just trying to gain control and send a message, and you know, uh, you know, rattle the say, et cetera. You know, nobody thought. So every 183 Chabad rabbis stayed. They stayed in the Ukraine, and I spoke to one of them, Rabbi Moskowitz. He's a classmate of mine. He's the chief rabbi of Kharkov, and um, we studied together. When he went to Kharkov to become chief rabbi, I drove him to the airport. So I've known him for a very long time. And um, we're good buddies. So I called him. It was a Saturday night. I think Putin invade, invaded on a Thursday. So it was a Saturday night, and I called him, and I said, how's it going? He goes, well, I'm in a shelter. There's bombs all around us. Um, and... and um, and you know, I'm not kind of, kind of not sure what the future is going to be, but we're here, we're here. And um, I told him, I asked him, "Are you nervous?" So he goes, 
truth be told, my whole upbringing, my whole upbringing about faith, trust, faith in God, trust in God, what my purpose is on this world, how I'm not, don't live for myself, but I live for others because he's, you know, he's, he comes from Venezuela, his wife comes from Australia. Nice Jewish communities there, maybe not so much in Venezuela anymore, but, um, and he lived in the States for a while. He goes, everything that I've studied my whole life prepared me for this moment. I said, what do you mean? He goes, I now know what my mission is. My mission is to get out as many people as I can out of the Ukraine and get them to Israel. That's my mission. So am I scared? How could you be scared when you know what your mission is? Am I afraid? I have trust in God. I have belief in God. I, 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 I'm, I'm just, I'm grateful that I have marching orders. Marching orders. And I believe this is the exact same thoughts that were going through Esther. I got a mission to do. It was clearly, Mordechai told me that you were made queen because of this. And, and she said, yes, I got it. I got it. And, and, and that's why, that's why she didn't kill herself. Because she was a woman on a mission. That's why she gave up her whole spiritual self because she knew clearly she had to save the people. She had to sleep with Hitler in order to save people. Thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people. She knew that she could not, she has to remain strong and not perish inside. She knew what she had to do. It wasn't easy. You know, they, um, they tell a story about a, a, a fellow in Moscow. He um, stands in Red Square shortly after the invasion, and he screams on the top of his lungs, or with the megaphone maybe, and he shouts, and he says, Putin is a meshugana. Putin is a nut job. Putin is a durak. He's a fool. A jerk. He got arrested. Immediately, he was brought in front of the judge because, you know, you don't, there's no bail there, so just sentencing. So the judge says, I'm giving you two, I'm giving you two lifetime sentences, life sentences. So he looked at the judge and he goes, why two? Why two? I said, Putin is a durak. Putin is a mashogun. Why two? So he goes, one, you, 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 you denigrate the head of state. That's a life sentence. And he goes, yeah, okay. Why the second life sentence? Secondly, is you just exposed a state secret. So, um, tongue in cheek. So, Akashverish was a Meshuggah, Putin was a, is a Meshuggah, and, um, but, you know, you got to learn how to, how to, how to navigate Meshuggah, and that's what Esther did, that's what she did. Now, Esther, if you notice at the beginning of the Megillah, in the first few chapters of the Megillah, Esther was very meek, an extremely meek person, right? The Torah tells us, that she was an orphan, had no father, had no mother. She was brought up in the house of Mordechai. You got to believe she felt somewhat displaced. And um, even when she was taken by 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 um, by by the palace, right? She was taken by the palace, and the palace said, you know, um, and and they they pampered these girls. They pampered them so they can be ready, and they gave them jewelry, and they gave them uh, you know soaps, and uh, you know Estee Lauder was there personally. To, to take care of them, and they made sure that they ate, um, you know, quinoa, um, and and um, and they made sure that they had all the um, delicacies and aged wine and etc. etc. And 
they were asked, what can we do to make you comfortable? And everybody said something else. The Megillah testifies that Esther said she asked for nothing. Right? Esther was just a quiet, quiet girl, teenage girl who went to yeshiva all her life. She asked for nothing. Right? And even when, five years later, when the decree took place and, and, and Mordechai told her, go beg by the king, she goes, you got the wrong guy. You got the wrong guy. I'm not going. I'm not going. If I go, I'm going to get killed. No, no, no. Send somebody else. And, and, um, and it's amazing transformation she had. Just amazing transformation. Is that as soon as he told her, this is your mission, boom. She said, she all of a sudden, you know, ruled the roost. She said, okay, this is the plan, Mordechai. Everybody's going to fast for three days. And um, I'm also going to fast. And I want you to gather everybody and pray. And I want you to gather the kids and pray. And then I'm going to go to the king. And then I'm all of a sudden, and, and, then, and then the rest of the story, which we'll discuss tomorrow. Amazing story about her, her, her diplomacy. Um, uh, all of a sudden, she became just this, this fearless leader. And the reason is because she had a mission. She had a purpose. She had direction. You know, many of us, present company included, flounder when we don't have direction. Unhappy. We, we, we're agitated. Anxiety. Heartburn. When we don't know which direction to go, when we don't know what we should do next. So we've done this and this and this and this. What, ne what we should do next, right? We, 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 Esther, once she knew what she had to do, she would be strong. I remember, by the way, I remember that I received my rabbinic ordination. And when I received it, I came out of the, you know, they said, yes, you know, this is your, you passed this test. You are now hereby fulfilled all the obligations. You are here, uh, you know, a rabbi in Israel. So I said, okay, okay, I'm going to become a judge, become a Jewish judge, because i got to keep on. i got to move, you know. So the next day, right into it. And that took me a couple of years, you know. And then and the, and the, the yeshiva offered these two degrees, right? You could become um, a rabbi, and then you take the next level, become a judge. At the same time, I was learning how to how to become a shocha to slaughter. I couldn't do the brisk thing. That that ain't happening. But um, I couldn't do the slaughtering either. Anyway, the day I finished and became a judge, that day, I went back to the dormitory, and I cried my eyes out. I was moving so hard for so long, pushing and pushing and pushing, and I I ignored everything around me. I just I had a goal, and the minute I reached my goal, I didn't have another goal, and I fell apart. So, you need, a person needs a goal in life, and that's one of the lessons that Esther we see from Esther. Very meek, and 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 very weak, but the minute she had that mission, she ran with it, and she became this heroine. That is Kisvuni Ladaris is literally we speak about her. What a figure. What sacrifice. What an amazing person Esther was. And tomorrow we're gonna see she wasn't only strong and amazing. She was just her brilliance was incredible. Her tact, her class, she she outwitted she outwitted Mordechai easily. Easily she outwitted him. Just an amazing thing. So that class is tomorrow at one o'clock. Um, we ask you please to, to, if you have any questions, you can ask here or you can email me, rabbi at the Chai Center. If you, or you can hear, if you'd like to see this class or um, any of our 300 plus classes, um, you go to the thechaicenter.com forward slash academy. I think yesterday's class is, is also a good, teaches us good lessons about Purim. It's very timely. Of course, tomorrow night we read the Megillah for the first time. Thursday's Purim. So um, 
And uh, don't, you can join the Chai Center. If you go to thechaicenter.com forward slash Purim, you will have a wealth of information on, on this upcoming Jewish holiday. God bless. Please share. And um, we should only meet on good occasions. Be well.